All right. This is Nifty Culture. I'm P.O. And this morning we have a very special guest, multidisciplinary artist. His work's been featured on Nifty Gateway. He was auctioned by Christie's this week. He is the creator of the Aku, the Moon God character, which is part of a 10-part series. Chapter three in that series is dropping tomorrow. He is a former uh, professional baseball player, played multiple seasons in the big leagues, Mr. Micah Johnson. How's it going, Micah? <laughs> doing well how are you today i'm good man i'm good i'm i was just telling you off air you know i'm a huge fan of your work really excited to have you here today uh the day before chapter three in the aku series drops uh so i'm just excited to kind of you know get into it and, and talk about what's going on with you no doubt no doubt we can do it. it's gonna be great <laughs> exciting it's, it's, it's awesome. been three months it's three months since we did a last drop so uh, it's good to be back <laughs> For sure. And I imagine, you know, it's been a pretty exciting three months given everything that's happened, uh, you know, in your career. But, you know, just kind of taking it from the top, um, you know, I just wanted to ask, like, how did the initial idea for the Aku character come about? You know, what kind of went into that? And once you started doing it, you know, how soon did you start running with the idea of making a 10 part series and everything that's kind of come along with that? You know, I think it's, you know, um, the backstory of Aku, if you look at my paintings, and that's really where they came from. And if you go back further than that, you see, uh, you know, why did I start painting astronaut, young black kids in astronaut helmets is because, you know, my nephew asked if astronauts could be black. And so that's the kind of lineage of, of Aku. Um, and then once I saw the paintings were taken off, uh, got represented in, in a gallery, had two solo exhibits, I said, uh, you know, I really want to take this character um, and really connect with a, a broader audience and, and, a, and a more uh, uh, younger demographic that, you know, you, you can't really access through just one of one paintings. And so, you know, I came up with this character, Aku, um, and reached out to my boy, Dirk. I was like, hey, Dirk, you know, he's a 3D animator. I said, how can we make this character um, come to life um, and, and brought Aku to life? And, and now, you know, the 10-part series was something that I thought would allow me to prove out the ip and prove out you know market fit um also i didn't know anybody in hollywood <laughs> i was like i can't what am i how do i go turn this into a movie i can't just I don't know, who do i email you know so i was like let me let, let me put it out here as an nft i've already been in nfts um for for, for some time at that point so i understood uh, the power of the uh, organic evangelist that you can build by releasing a good NFT. And they'll tell me if it's a bad NFT. And so uh, the idea with those 10 chapters was to prove that out uh, over time. Now, after the first one, we inked the movie deal. So things ex got expedited quickly. Uh, and I was able to iterate on that. And now I'm building out in a way to uh, build an ecosystem around Aku prior to the, to the release of the film. The movie deal came faster than you expected. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Uh, I was, I was really thinking, you know, hopefully after these ten chapters we can show them something, you know. Uh, but after the first one, that's that's all they needed, and I think that people they saw the, the potential there from the storyline and 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 what it, what I, what it represented, and you know what I stood for, and and you know, uh, they they really got around it. Gotcha. I mean, that's fascinating that it, it happened so quick, but I can't say that I'm surprised given the super strong performance of that Genesis uh, Aku chapter and, you know, how it performed on Nifty Gateway, the reception from, you know, NFT uh, investors, collectors, fans. So, you know, congratulations on that, of course. Um, you know, when I my understanding of how you got into, you know, doing art is that while you were a pro baseball player, you know, you were dealing with the pressures of being a pro ball player by turning to creative outlets, you know, playing piano, painting on canvas. And then I know that, you know, you had these exhibitions in LA, you know, your canvas paintings were, were displayed. Um, you know, obviously I don't know every detail, but I was wondering how did you actually get introduced to NFTs and what prompted you to, to take the jump into the NFT space? Um, just from back then, when I get into it, I started looking around at late 2019, um, about crypto in general and, and discovered NFTs and digital art. Um, and I saw that there were people making money on it. And so that was, you know, what drew me in was the ability to generate revenue through art. 
independent of having to go through a gallery or getting representation or, you know, going that being accepted. You know what I mean? Um, there's people out there making money on their own. And I, that's what was fascinating to me. And as I started to read the three or four articles that were out there at the time <laughs> about NFTs, uh, I, you know, sort of following these people on Twitter and one thing would lead to another. And now I was in these kind of discords and, and, and DMs and, and, and just learning about the technology, learning about, you know, uh, crypto and that kind of uh, embrace, embracement or I don't know, they, they welcomed me in. I don't know if that's a word, but they welcomed me in. That's what made me stick with with crypto and with NFTs. It's like, the, you know, these people were onboarding me. That's awesome. And, you know, I'd imagine that making the shift from professional sports to art, you know, that's about as extreme of a shift as I can think of when it comes to careers and <laughs> environments. Yeah. And, and like, you know, culture, right? Um, was there like a moment that you can pinpoint? Uh, you know, I don't know if this is like something that would happen, but is there a moment that you can pinpoint where you kind of knew that art was going to become your life's work? Um, no, because I don't think about what I do as a specific thing. I, like my life work isn't art. My life, I think my life work is to inspire the next kids to be, to believe that they can be a, a major league baseball player. But instead of doing that in a traditional route, uh, I'm trying to do on a broader scale um, and inspire kids to believe they can be anything. And so I'm not the type of person who's going to sit on a soapbox and say, I did this and this and this, and this is the recipe to do this, and this because nobody cares. Like, it's not that cool. Like, I think my life work, it hit me when I would show my nephew those paintings of him in an astronaut helmet and see his reaction. And it hit me when we were doing sovereignty and those boys were wearing the space helmet after saying they weren't smart enough to be an astronaut. That's when I knew my life work was to, you know, use this helmet as a, um, a tool for empowerment. And whatever that medium was, um, I was gonna, you know, you could leverage it, you know, and get it out there. And I believe the animation, um, Sorry, I'm pouring some coffee in here. Uh, All good. I believe that I believe the animation is the the real key to a, a kid's heart. And so, if they can see representation through animation in a palatable way, gaming and books and things like that, um, that they can believe. It's different than me going to uh, elementary school and telling kids you can be a major league baseball player and this is you have to sacrifice and you know. Who cares? Like they don't care about that. They want, you know what I mean. And so, that, I think that's my life work. Yeah, I mean, you know that that definitely is a, a great response. Um, you know, when I think about the Aku series, right? Because I've seen the paintings, and then I look at the the actual animation, and I wanted to ask you about like you know that decision, but you sort of just answered it right there. Um, you know, how did you seamlessly go to that kind of animated work? I, you already mentioned that partner that did the 3D and did the animation work, but it just seems to work so well in both chapters that have been released so far. And it really captures, you know, I think the essence of the paintings that you actually did on canvas. You know, can you talk a little bit about that process of, of creating the animation and what was important to you when making it? Yeah, no doubt. Um, for me, this whole process has been such an organic and uh, lightning in the bottle moment because when I went to Dirk initially, you know, it was like, yeah, we'll create this character, but he resonated with the character and we just understood each other, you know, like it was just like, I get you, you get me. Um, and he believed in the vision from the beginning. And so he is one of the, luckily one of the best teachers there there is when it comes to, you know, explaining and, 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 and uh, putting the effort into it show somebody. So he put together videos to show me how to make assets and 3D assets and put together unity scenes and help me. And then, you know, he's been along with, along with this journey. And now as we scale um, and with chapter three, we brought on more asset builders and we're bringing on more animators and more highly specific areas. Um, the idea is that we can produce the highest level quality of 3D content um, 
in house, if that makes sense, and build this story even more. And each time we would come up, we like pushing ourselves to each time there's a new chapter. You know, it's all handmade assets, right? It's all in a specific style. Um, and and it's all been a learning curve. It's been a big learning curve for me. Um, but one thing that I my biggest role in in it all is this is what we want to say. This is the message, and, and be able to um, co- uh, cohesively get everybody on board with that message for that one content piece, that one chapter is like that's where I find a lot of joy and fulfillment. Yeah. And I mean, obviously the message is at the forefront of the work. You know, one thing I was going to ask you was how important it was for, you know, there to be a socially conscious, like progressive, you know, message that people can get behind. But obviously you've already answered that in your, in your responses, you know, have you seen athletes like other professional athletes around this at all? Like if people reached out to you, what's the athletic community been like? The response from, um, it's incredible. There's so many people that you know, are supporting Aku behind the scenes that if we had told me I'd been talking to them on a daily basis or they would be interested in Aku or, you know, I like a, I would never believe it. And so <laughs> that's re- that's really cool. And it's super cool because it's behind the scenes. Like we don't we don't need to go out in front and say, oh, we're working with so and so and so because what it's really about is aligning with the best possible people that are aligned with the mission of Aku. And what are we, how can we do that together? And so instead of using them as, oh, you know, we're working with so-and-so or, or so-and-so and you know what I mean? We're actually really trying to figure out how we can work together to build, expand the IP, expand Aku into different demographics, expand Aku into different verticals. And it becomes, you know, a great relationship with some of the people that we're working with. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, and it's so cool to do that behind the scenes because I think a lot of people that create, you know, their dream is to be able to collaborate with someone and, and, you know, use that person that's way above them as like a stepping stone or just, you know, an opportunity to say, I collaborated with that person. But it sounds like the way that you're angling it, you're just basically partnering with those people to improve the work and improve, you know, the reach that comes along with the work. So that's pretty fascinating for me to hear. Um, You know, speaking of the whole, really franchise at at this point that you're building, right? You have the 10 part NFT series that's still going on. Obviously chapter three drops tomorrow. You have the uh, pieces, the piece that you got auctioned off by Christie's. The movie has been commissioned. Um, You know, what, what can you tell us about future plans for the franchise? Are we looking at action figures? Are we looking at physical collectibles? What can you share about that? Yeah. uh, We will probably I don't want to say too much about it, um, <laughs> but what I will say is that I believe that with the people that are supporting Aku and with the community um, of a thousand true fans, that you can mimic the ecosystem of a large distribution studio such as a, as a Universal or a Disney and enable participation in the growth of the expansion of the Aku IP from everyday people. Um, the way I say, the way I believe in Aku is, Aku is a conduit to prove that anything is possible. So we might as well try something that no one's ever done. And so we might as well risk everything to, uh, do it in a way where you can have participation from people from my neighborhood, right. Who had never had a chance to be involved in, um, uh, invest in a startup or get in early on a deal, you know, um, now that's kind of how we're building it out. So you can imagine, you know, think about your favorite Disney IP, everything that goes along with that. That's what we're building out. For sure. And, you know, we talk about this on this channel a lot is the fact that NFT technology, just given the strength of the technology, the ability for a creator to directly connect with collectors and buyers and just fans of their work. It's just the next layer and really a very big layer of cutting out the middleman. And I think that this is probably at this point, one of the most, if not the most built out example of that, where you literally have essentially a franchise that's already being built and the money that's, you know, uh, uh, being used to, 
continue the franchise is being raised by directly selling artwork to the collectors that are interested. And it's definitely a framework that's going to be used more and more by creatives. So, you know, definitely hats off to you for how early you were in that. I think Genesis came out in February or, or March, right? So that's yeah, pretty right. early. And obviously... Yeah, you had the um, the statue or the, the physical sculpture before that. So that was kind of the, the origin of Aku, right? Um, I wanted to talk to you about the Christie's experience because I have to imagine, you know, if you told yourself three years ago or four years ago that you were going to get auctioned off by Christie's within three or four years, you'd probably, you know, be relatively surprised by that. I'd, I'd imagine. I don't know how you think. Um, what was that whole experience <laughs> like and how wh what's that been like for you? It's incredible. Uh would I have been surprised though? No, because I don't, I, I look at this life and it's anything is possible. I truly do believe that. Like I truly do believe it. And so I go, I live day by day with no expectations, you know, I don't, with no end goals in mind, no dream placement or dream things, because you never know. Like if you might not, if Christie's never would have happened, maybe in a better opportunities ahead. So to be honest with you, I never thought about it like that. One thing that, it, what, what I love though, is that with the Christie's, we were able to give somebody an opportunity to name a character after their daughter, right? And if you think about it, imagine his daughter and them grow up watching the Aku film and, and, and now she's watching it with her daughter. Her daughter's watching it. It's like, you, you know, my daughter loves movies from, early 90s like the fox and the hound and and oliver and company's her favorite movie that's like what 30 30 plus years ago so that was what was really special to me is <laughs> giving eric the collector the opportunity to name this character after his daughter that, that at, at christie's and so they can go back and, and he can tell her that's a special moment for them to share um that's that's really cool to me as a dad you know like that's that's super cool. Man. I, 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 that's really special. That's incredible. And that's also in line with like, you know, the whole open sourcing of projects through NFT technology. So I think that's really cool that you did that with the Christie's auction. Um, I know that, you know, other notable artists like Mad Dog Jones were auctioned the same week. What can you say about like the the kind of relationships you formed with other artists in the space? Like, would you say you formed some strong bonds in the space? And, and what do those mean to you? Yeah, for sure. Because the way the, my relationship with artists in this space is I'm looking at, I engage with artists now from like a fan perspective, right? Because now I've gone a, 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 a media route, right? Instead of just like, I have my traditional art, so I can, I understand what it is like to be an artist, right? But now I'm using NFT to go this the media route. And so it's not necessarily about uh, uh, doing fine art like they're doing. And so I'm just an admirer of, the, of their work, right? Like to see it and understand it and talk to them, um, like Mad Dog and, and Fuck Render and, and Victor and, and all of it and, and, uh, at, the, at, the, at the Christie's event um, and just getting to know artists and admire their work. I'm just a, I'm just a fan at this point, you know, uh, of their work. And I think that the, the one of one art is, and, and things like that is, is incredibly uh, going to be like it is now but going to be even more incredibly valuable because these are um, artists producing at a very high level and one thing that i never really thought about um from the digital artist perspective is that they've already had this community and they're supporting each other long before nfts through instagram right through liking their pictures sharing their posts so you see them all with these massive following but what's really cool for me to see is how they're now converting those likes that they have grinded for for all these years and support each other into actual dollars, you know, like liking is the new buying. So now that's what's really fascinating to me is to see this their their little community that they formed over years grinding together, flourishing, <laughs> you know, I think that's that's one of the coolest like ecosystems within digital art or NFTs. It's incredibly cool, man. And, and, you know, the fact that you form those relationships is awesome. Obviously, the NFT space is a very supportive space, like you said, and these artists have been supporting them, uh, each other long before they were able to monetize their work in such like a, a streamlined and, and yeah. borderline mainstream way. Um, 
you have a very passionate fan base and I know that, you know, from spending some time in your discord, you know, you, you've like formed relationships with people in the community that are like collectors of yours and fans of yours. Um, a lot of your fans actually submit fan art. That's super dope of the Aku character. What has that experience meant for you to, to create this character, to create this artwork and then have fans of the artwork use their own creative abilities to run with it and submit their own art that stands on its own? I think that's going to be an integral part of the expansion of, of Baku is allowing people, giving them the tools, whether it's 3D, maybe it's putting videos up and teaching them how to, you know, create 3D uh, uh, scenes with Aku. Uh, I think that's an incredible part of Aku. And I think it intertwines really nicely with the educational vertical of Aku. Uh, and a lot of the, the conversations we're having within that department and with the community is like, how can we create assets that are downloadable and accessible to everybody. And so that th they can create and they can make their own Aku because because Aku is faceless, they can, Aku can be anybody, you know? And so to see people's versions of Aku um, selfishly can help me inform, uh, make informed decisions about the the story of Aku, the, the IP development of Aku. So it's, I want people to, create as much art as they possibly can with Aku. It's kind of funny because I think like someone was telling me this the other day, uh, back in the early, whenever uh, Walt Disney came out with the Mickey Mouse Club, like he shut it down because uh, he, he didn't have uh, ownership over the IP. Everybody, everybody is, is everywhere, right? All these Mickey Mouse Clubs are popping up and, and he shut it down because he's like, I don't have ownership. He wanted all control over the, the IP. And I think it's different now. Now you want everybody to use your IP. Like, you, you look at what the board apes are doing and all these other um, communities, like go create, you know, and I think that's the best, really a cool power shift. Without a doubt, Bored Apes is a wonderful example because when you buy a Bored Ape NFT, you own the IP to that NFT, and then you could go and like run with that and start a business. There's, you know, people that are selling T-shirts and other kinds of merch. There's actually a coffee company that's running with that. And and I totally get what you mean, how back in the day, they kind of would look at that as a threat. And I think that's mm -hmm. because the world wasn't as interconnected through things like, you know, the internet, for example. But now, you know, you benefit from people running with Aku. You benefit from people, you know, making their own Aku uh, derivatives. And that just mm -hmm. all kind of fuels and, and circles back to the brand. So that's interesting. Um, all right. So, so Mike, I know you got to go soon. So last question. Uh, we have chapter three coming out. You know, if people own chapters one, two, and three, that's the only way for them to get chapter four. And if I recall correctly, they get two copies of chapter four, which I think is super cool and, and very favorable to collectors. You know, what can, what can you tell us? I know a lot is under wraps, but what can you tell us about what comes next for Aku six months from now, a year from now, and just the franchise as a whole? Well, chapter three is a critical chapter for uh, the evolution of Aku and really starting to see the, the backstory of Aku. Um, it's our longest chapter. Uh, it's all hand, handmade assets. It's a real quick look at one of the first versions of the Aku animation style. And that chapter is incredibly critical um, and very powerful chapter. And chapter four, we really wanted to make it really special because if you have four, like you said, it's a, you, you're, you're airdrop four. You could have four sets of all, the, all of them and you get eight chapter fours. And that puts the power of, you know, into the hands of the collectors to determine how many people can actually collect, how many can reach the moon god status. So it's not in my hands of the scarcity, it's in the collector's hands of scarcity. Um, and chapter four is an incredibly um, eye-opening chapter, very special. And it'd be the only chapter that will include the new character in, because uh, I think I want the value to then again, go back into the holders of that. They got it for free. Now it's the only chapter to think about this character now is becomes this big thing. And, Hey, Mike, I think we lost you for a second, bud. 
All right, guys. Well, while we're waiting for Micah to come back, I'm just going to quickly pull up, um, you know, some of the concept artwork from the Aku series from early on. Um, you know, we have this physical sculpture, which was the very first installment in the Aku series. This was auctioned off, and I believe there were ten. Um, there, there were ten different sculptures. No two ones were alike, and so uh, that was a really cool project. And then the number one uh, sculpture out of this was actually um, put in a vault and it's going to be in a vault for a couple of years. So I think that that's like an incredibly cool feature. I'm going to pull up Genesis.001, which is actually the original um, in the 10 part series featuring Aku. And this one is a top five all time seller on Nifty Gateway. And I think Micah is hopefully back. Can hey, you Micah. Can you hear me? I can. Yep. I can. Yep. Can you hear me? Having some reception issues here. All good, though. Um, I'll wait for Micah to come back. And yeah, we'll just kind of look at Genesis here. Hey, Micah, can you hear me, man? So yeah, this is the first chapter, and this is uh, these paintings here are Micah's actual physical canvases that he did, and these have been exhibitioned. Here, let's give it another go. Can you hear me now? Hey, Micah. Yeah, I'm here. I can. Yeah. It's my agent called me, man. My bad. Awesome, man. Well. <laughs> all good, all good. Well, yeah. So, um, you know, you were talking about chapter three and four. Any closing thoughts on what the future holds for Aku? Yeah, yeah. I was saying chapter four is really special. It wanted to be the first time you you a chapter, the only first and only time you see the new character, and so to, to give value back to the community. Uh, and we're we're the the Aku token. We're we're going. To, it's the social token that we believe will power the ecosystem of Aku, uh, and in the future, um, and that will be coming out um, very soon and be retroactively re redistributed to the chapter holders. Um, and we'll work together as a community to develop really great use cases early on, while also um, we've got some things we're working on that will um, be accessible to only chapter holders. Um, and then planning something in December that will be very big and special in bringing Aku to life um, in the real world. Um, and that's it, just building, just trying to build. And, and, and to be really honest, the focus is always going to be on what can we build that drives value back into the audience? Because most, that's the most important thing to what we're doing is the audience and building that. And we only can do that if we're focused on driving value back into the community. And so every step we're taking, we hope, does that. Um, and, and it's a symbiotic relationship. You know, the bigger the audience becomes, the more that we can do. The bigger it comes, the more that we can drive value back to the audience. Absolutely, man. Couldn't have said it better myself. Everybody, um, you know, make sure that you check out Micah's work. His chapter three in the Aku 10 part series is dropping tomorrow at 12 p.m. Eastern on Nifty Gateway. 2 p.m. 2 uh, p.m. 2 p.m. Sleep in. Two. Shake the hangover off. Wake Sorry, up. Bro. You, know, you know, shake the hangover off in the morning on Sunday. And, and, and get you some breakfast and, and then 2 p.m we're, we're going to probably do a, a twitter spaces or a clubhouse beforehand like we always do and, and just get it get it cracking so it's gonna be fun it's always fun sundays are fun absolutely so, sorry about that uh micah so 2 p.m sunday fun day sleep in shake off the hangover check mike out on twitter spaces make sure you join micah's discord uh and follow him on twitter micah thank you so much man this was a real pleasure Oh, thank you, homie. I really appreciate it. All right. Thanks for watching.